Hello there and welcome to How to Run the Dragon of Icepire Peak. Today we're talking about the Dragon Barrow adventure quest thing. And during our playthrough, I made the biggest mistake I have ever made as a dungeon master. It's a big yikes. This is when you... Um, do, 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 do. Gosh, they need it, to watch the video. It's, 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 when, it's when you yes, do that. No, no, exactly. Right. That's, yes. No, they, but they need to watch to... It's big yikes. No. Yeah, it's, it's bad. Hey everybody, welcome back to J and J Tabletop. I'm Josh. With me, as always, is Jake, and we're doing another episode of our Dragon of Ice Fire Peak. How to today's episode is on the Dragon Barrow, Dragon Barrow, Dragon Sombrero. I'm excited about this one because, like you heard, like what Jake said before, there's a pretty big oops that happened here. We ran this adventure, and we're gonna do this video for you, so you don't have to make the same mistakes that. Jake made and that made, made, you know, I'll give you my insight as a player too. It's pretty <laughs> easy not to make this mistake. <laughs> but like we said, we'll go over that later. <laughs> so why not start with the quest card? The dragon that besets us is not the first to threaten this region. Between here and Neverwinter lies the barrow bound of a warrior whose magical dragon slaying sword helped fell a green dragon terrorizing the high road a century ago. Rumor has it the Dragon Slayer sword is buried there too. Retrieve it and let the sword be its own reward. Unlike the last quest card in the Woodland Mance, where you just expect Falcon to reward the players. <laughs> There's a little more up front, like, hey, we're not giving you anything, but there's a cool sword there, and that's what you should go get it for. <laughs> Given the nature of the quest, I think that's entirely appropriate. So essentially, just to go over the um, the location a little bit, Lady Tanamir Alagandar. It sounds like a weird, a yep, weird. You did dish well. They serve, yep. you know. <laughs> you did you know. well. <laughs> can I can I get the the Lady Tanamir Alagandar, please? You know, it's, I don't know. Like later, Tina Marie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, how you doing? Alagandar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I prefer Lady Tanamir Alavodka personally, but nice. Anyway, Lady Tanamir Alagandar, uh, along with the help of some friends and, and uh, you know, party members, right? This is D&D, &D, so that's how that works. She Absolutely. had fought and killed a green dragon that had been terrorizing the high road in that area. In that process, she actually died, you know, in, the, in that battle. But her and her compatriots have been laid to rest there in the barrow per her dying wishes. That's kind of all the information they give you. I feel like it's very easy to flesh out some of these details if you want. Uh, in our playthrough, Daisy, she was a zealot barbarian, and based on just the way the game was going, uh, Bahamut seemed to be like the very logical choice to connect there. And so in my mind, Lady Tanamir was a paladin of Bahamut, so it felt like a very natural way to connect the character to the story. And I would suggest that any of you that's watching this and you're running this adventure, if there is any connection point, maybe there's a paladin in your group or a cleric in your group or somebody that might be more of a warrior and have some kind of divine theme going on one way or another. It doesn't have to be. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. But anything that would connect one of the characters to have some kind of personal connection to the story. Like if there was no... If Daisy wasn't in there, maybe I... I might have been like, hey, this might be a fun uh, potential ancestor or like another Winterburn vassal or knight. That could have been another way to try and connect things a little bit, too. But the way the story unfolded, it felt natural to make it a thing for Daisy. I think it worked out really well that way because um, she she just felt that much more connected and intertwined with the story. And that made her want to kind of even do more with with the kind of Bahamut thing that theme that she had you know like it took something that was like I don't want to say it was surface level but like something that was like maybe my character is interested in this and then there was a little bit there and then you met her with a little bit more and then she was like okay I'll take that and run with it and it, it added something yeah. and it was very cool yeah she even had taken one of the dragon chess pieces from the butter skull ranch that I was just a small detail I was like oh Cool. I didn't think anything of that, but it became significant. So that brings us to the quest goals here. I mean, really, it's very simple. Get the Dragon Slayer sword. And uh, side note, make that a version that would be useful. Like if you have somebody that's a great weapon master and they're just all they want to do is wield a big weapon, make it a great sword. 
that's something they would naturally want to do if they're doing their sword and board long sword is, is good did you have the flame tongue at this point i didn't no, have it yet. i don't think I you did yeah immediately after yeah uh, flame tongue isn't in the adventure Probably that might have been out of the adventure. <laughs> so that might have been another mistake I made, but that might be uh, the princess is in another castle on that one. I like uh, it. <laughs> I'm sure you did. <laughs> and that's actually at the end of the day. If you're having fun, you're having fun and you're winning. Mm -hmm. Then, Josh, here we come to traveling to the location and getting to the Barrow from Fandolin roughly takes the better part of two days. So there's going to be one long rest. There's a centaur named Xanth that just approaches the group as they're traveling there. And this centaur was driven from Neverwinter Wood and basically warns the group of the Will-O-Wisps. In our playthrough, you had already dealt with the orcs in Neverwinter Wood that had driven Xanth out of there. I feel like the way this was presented, the way I presented this to you, it probably felt like there's supposed to be more there. Yeah, it was definitely it was definitely a little awkward, I, th I think, because it was just like... What's the purpose of, of Xanth? All right. He just he just comes by and he's like, hey, uh, I saw saw flashy lights flying around outside that barrow. You weren't thinking about going there, would you? And you're like, yeah, we were thinking about going there. And like, oh, well, there's some light things. Lights, That's all yeah. I can tell you. And you're yeah. like, cool. <laughs> nice talking to you, stranger. You know, like, yeah. it was... In all seriousness, though, I think with Xanth, this is much more significant if the group hasn't done the Woodland Mance quest because mm -hmm. the Dragon Barrow, Axe Home, and um, Woodland Mance are all the same tier. So it's entirely possible that your group is going to do it a different order than ours did. Ours just kind of naturally unfolded in the way that it did, where it felt like the Neverwinter Wood was just kind of its own subsection of this adventure. I actually think you could just ignore Xanth altogether if they did the Woodland Mance. What you're saying is, knowing what you know now, you probably wouldn't have Centaur. Yeah, Centaur. I see what you did Centaur. there. Cent yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well done. Moving on to the Dragon Barrow. <laughs> Assuming that the group leaves from Vandalin roughly in the morning, they should be getting there just about at sunset, sometime just afterwards, allowing them to see these floating lights dancing about. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. You could have them all roll perception checks. You could all have them roll a random die and the highest one notices it. It doesn't matter. I think if there's some kind of insight or intelligence check, you can let them know that it doesn't seem like mechanical like it's not a pattern there's there are, they seem to be a lot living lights of some kind most players i think kind of know what a will-o'-wisp is on some level they've probably well, seen navi from zelda or you know whatever it may be whether you played skyrim and you got your butt kicked from a will-o'-wisp he's like holy crap this thing is really strong i'll say one thing you certainly know a thing about will-o'-wisps don't you uh yes yes i do so that is uh, not yet, Josh. Not yet. We're we're gonna, we're gonna still tease <laughs> tease the big goof. <laughs> <laughs> so the entrance to the Dragon Barrow is based on this adventure, technically locked behind a DC ten perception check. Which to me, uh, it's not really too great of an obstacle or die roll to overcome a DC ten. Anything really isn't that hard to do. Usually, at least one person is trained in perception, but still, that's not really the best practice you can just let them all roll and the highest one finds it or you're just it's more about how long it takes them to find it than it is yeah or the lowest one trips over it you could do that too everybody rolls a natural one like, stub your toe and it hurts <laughs> it really hurts <laughs> this is where my goof happened so these will-o'-wisps as the group approaches the the barrow they just go through the ground to go back to go into the barrow itself why don't we go over some of the mechanics or the Will-O-Wisps, because, you know, it's kind of a big deal. This is where I made my big goof. We actually have a video on Will-O-Wisps, which you could check out. It's uh, one of our creature features. You should check out that whole playlist. We've got some wonderful combinations. Will-O-Wisps, they're fast. They have a high AC of 19. They have a hit points of 22, but they're also resistant to non-magical damage, which I think it's highly likely that the group won't have magical means of, dis of attacking this creature. They're also resistant to acid, cold, fire, necrotic, thunder. They have 22, but they're like barbarians. They, it's almost like they really kind of have 44. Uh, they're immune to lightning, immune to poison, immune to a million conditions. They have dark vision. Their speed has a fly speed of 50 feet. But they've got some really, really, really nasty 
combinations. And the thing I'm going to zoom in on now is their consume life bonus action. And the Will-O-Wisp can target one creature it can see within five feet of it that has zero hit points and is still alive. That last section, I, I kind of just... Oops. <laughs> Didn't really pay attention to. It says the target must then succeed on a DC 10 constitution saving throw against this magic or die. If the target dies, the Will-O-Wisp regains 10 hit points or 3d6 hit points. So the way this ended up playing out is I wasn't paying attention to the zero hit points part. And in our game, we have a, a fighter, a barbarian, and a bard. I was thinking, like, of course, the barbarian and the fighter would be fine if they have to make this saving throw. <laughs> I have to make sure I don't kill the bard. This is a very, very unfair mechanic. So I ended up coming up with a fun solution, I think, to, to the, if it happened to go that way. But Izzy played Daisy, who is uh, one of her primary motivations was to keep all of her friends safe and constantly was putting herself in harm's way, even to go against the plan that Marcus would so carefully craft. <laughs> and of course, she rolled awful on her con save. And I just killed her. Yeah, I, I just killed her. I was like, yep, she's dead. She's dead as a doornail, Smalls. Because <laughs> the, the part that you skipped over be, being the it has to have zero hit points and still be alive, not like yeah, I don't she know, was she like almost fully healthy hit almost. or whatever. And the, yeah, like, yeah, yep, that'll do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it, read, read the things. It, there's value in reading things more than once. <laughs> I will say as a player, it made it more interesting. When I evaluated this originally, I was like, this is a bad monster. Shame on you, Wizards of the Coast. You're just awful. But I came up with a plan to handle it if it did, because because I felt that was unfair. I had in my mind that the Dragon Slayer sword was tied to Bahamut and that if anyone had died, I figured that actually it would lead Daisy to bring them back from the dead. But I killed Daisy, so... So we ended up having that play out a little differently, and then we had a fun little one-on-one -on -one RP as to what happened. So I would actually highly encourage you to watch it. I think our playthrough is actually kind of special. So if you're watching this, I think you should watch that too. It's fun. It's goofy. It's great D&D, &D, and it's great RP. But yeah, basically from a strategic standpoint, the Will-O-Wisps are just trying to lure the group into the pit traps that are marked on the map. They use their great speed and invisibility to their advantage whenever possible they're very they're smart creatures they're not they're not stupid they're not gonna particularly look to confront head-on they also can't just kill people without a fair fight. <laughs> they're good i mean even without the uh the goof right they, they are still it's a good threat you know like you said yeah. they have a lot of immunities and especially on a party with low magic like that's not easy you know yeah because marcus was the the classic polar master sentinel we even used the unearth arcana tunnel fighter fighting style so we we had a lot going on there but removing daisy and then landor and marcus working together to figure this out there was tension like when, yeah. the, when those that thing was charging you were like get behind me like you like making sure landor mm -hmm. was there you're like it was yep. there was tension there. It was like, oh, I'm gonna make sure he's inspired so he hits and, and reduces the speed to zero. It was it was it intense. Was in, it was intense. That was exactly what I was gonna say. It made us do kind of kind of weird weird things tactically too, because like I'm just gonna read this next section quickly just so so what I'm about to say makes sense. D4, it gives skeletal surprise. So Lady Tanamir's horse remains are here as well as her saddle. Jake, I believe you, you said you modified that, so it's it's just the saddle, right? Mm -hmm. I ended up making but, it like it could summon the ghost, and it just seemed easier and simpler. Oh, did was all of that you made that up? Was I not? Was were we not supposed to get a? I think so. Game? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Oh wow! All right. Well, this was a very cool thing then that that Jake made up. Basically, <laughs> it was it was the saddle of Lady Tanamir's horse, and when you activate it, it basically summoned like a, a ghostly spectral horse thing that you could just ride like a regular horse. He described these halls as like very narrow and everything and not a lot of <laughs> yeah. space. In my mind, I'm like, perfect. Because as long as I could still fit the horse through here, <laughs> that's just a barrier. <laughs> and it could kick or it could do whatever. <laughs> or it could, you know, it yeah. <laughs> at least do something. So me and Michael pretty much went through the rest of this dungeon <laughs> with the horse 
trying to lead the way. I know, um, I kept being like, this is really close quarters. This is awkward. And you're like, uh-huh, yep. keep moving forward. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, okay, exactly. it's so cramped, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. So I feel like the rest of the adventure is, is pretty straightforward, right? You just kind of go yeah. through the map, clear out the place, get the loot, get the sword, and, and all that. There was some interesting loot here, and in, in our playthrough, we actually didn't get all of it for obvious reasons, right? Like you, you proved the place to be very dangerous. You could fail a DC 10 save and then just die. Outright. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so we got what we needed and we left. As soon as we got, um, I was going to say Melly, as soon as we got uh, Daisy back up, we pretty much just group hugged and bounced out of there. What kind of treasure did we miss? Was there anything interesting in there aside from the sword? Yeah, in section D7, there's the Adventurer's Sepulcher. There is a Loot of Illusions and a Necklace of Fireballs. So the Loot of Illusions is one of those common items that is just kind of fun. Basically, just, you know, you make illusory visual effects within a five foot radius sphere centered on the instrument. If you're a bard, it increases to 15 feet. We had a bard in our group, Landor, so I thought that could just be fun. And you never know what a player is going to do with a, an item like that that could just it could be silly it could be funny it could be really creative and clutch like whatever it is that's just a fun item to give out knowing michael it would have been pretty creative and clutch yeah all of the above <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> the other item is necklace of fireball it's like you would just had like limited uses to cast fireball <laughs> that's like the most classic spell Oof. and i remember like when you guys left i was like i don't blame them at all like i you guys that was one of my most favorite rp moments the goof i made with the will-o-wisp was just i'll just say it was just so egregiously bad but because of the plan i had the way it unfolded there was such tension there was such uh, like emotion behind it it was it turned out so good it was like bob ross like happy little accidents like there are mm -hmm. no mistakes like it was just one of those things if you make a mistake seriously don't sweat it roll with it yeah there's a million like unnecessarily long videos all entitled like how to fail forward. Just watch like the 10 minutes of our playthrough or just yes. this video. How do you fail forward? If you accidentally kill a character, find a way to bring them back and make it important and make that stress actually matter, right? It didn't feel yeah. like nothing when she came back. It wasn't like, well, consequences don't matter because she came back. It was like, oh, she came back. We need to make sure this doesn't happen again. Let's get the hell out of here. Exactly. Like that, <laughs> that's, and, and that's making a game you... real. Yeah, and you two were debating, like, should we leave and bring her body to Neverwinter and pay to have a cleric bring her back? Like, that was something you were like, we probably should do that, right? And yeah. then you decided, like, well, let's just see if we can finish this and then do what we got to do. And it ended up uh, changing Michael's spell choice because he hit Magical Secrets. He took Revivify, which was a little hidden hidden thing I added to the Dragon Slayer sword that it could count as the spell components for Revivify because it was diamond encrusted and it was just a fun little thing. Ended up giving him his nickname, Landor the Death Destroyer. <laughs> Gosh, I forgot about that. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> so D7 is the treasure and section D8 is the Dragon Slayer. That's where the sword is. It's where the fight is. There is a Will-O-Wisp there. There's a pit trap, but also in the tomb area there's an invisible stalker i remember when this happened josh you guys were like is this lady tanamir you know like you weren't sure like is she like driven mad or something like is she just protecting us and testing us to make sure we're worth like all these thoughts i i, I felt like we were going through your guys's head mm -hmm. i was like nah, this is an invisible stalker <laughs> like, that's just the way it kind of was presented <laughs> to me fighting an invisible stalker by itself alone is a decent challenge they have decent ac disadvantage to attack you guys end up killing the will-o-wisp i think before you actually fought the stalker but i think the will-o-wisp could and should be aware of what's going on and try to use the invisible stalker to its advantage especially if, if you feel like your group has kind of been running through maybe it's like you want to up the challenge a little bit really just have the will-o-wisp just like oh no i'm just gonna chill back here not waiting for you up in, the, in front of the, the pit trap like you know it could have been a much more like you're gonna fight the invisible stalker and a will-o-wisp especially with just the two of us at that point that would have been brutal very different uh, fight yeah yeah who says early level D, &D can't be difficult 
And don't be afraid to kill your players. Kill your, kill, well, don't kill your players. Kill your char- yeah. the players' characters. <laughs> don't be afraid to kill people, okay? That's what we preach here. <laughs> and change your tabletop. Looking for something to defend myself with. I have this pen. <laughs> <laughs> they say it's mightier than the sword, so maybe you're, you've got the advantage. All right, Josh. What do you think of this adventure? Normally we like to evaluate it. I liked this one a lot. Um, you know, obviously we we talked about Xanth kind of just being a little awkward in there, but I mean, one, it's it's only awkward based on context, and two, even if it, if it is awkward, sometimes that's fun. It's it's fun yeah. to throw in little weird moments. Uh, <laughs> Embrace the there. awkward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I I really liked this quest. It's not that it was the the first one that felt like no, it's not. It's not. It wasn't the first one that felt like actually stressful or anything like that. But it. Definitely a stressful quest. It was one that was important. Uh, it was interesting. And it's something that, you know, when we were there and, and Daisy was dead, we're like, well, as much as we want to just take her off to ne- Neverwinter, we need to get this sword because this is what we came here to do. And, you know, whether we save her or not, like, she's going to want us to kill that dragon. And that's what we're going to do. We need the sword to do it really highlighted that decision for you guys a lot it's one of those side quests that like it's completely random right it's just a it's a building the story of the world where like oh yeah this is a person that exists who killed a dragon and whatever and it's rumored that there's a good weapon there Mm -hmm. but it's something that builds the world a little bit makes the world feel more real and it encourages your players to take risks to to get something interesting get something important but yeah I, i liked it all that was very long winded way of me saying (laughs) <laughs> very good quest <laughs> yeah i enjoyed it i enjoyed the just the dynamic between everybody at the table even after mistakes i made the way it was handled honestly i feel like it ran beautifully the only tips i would really say is to just lean into making it feel suspenseful and creepy the will wisps are trying to trick the player the characters into doing stuff so have fun with that like just have fun with that it might work it might not work like they might come up with like i'm gonna ride this spectral horse that isn't technically in the adventure but it's what i put there but it was using it as sort of like a a melee meat shield even though it was a ghost shield but you know it's that kind of a thing and i think just lean into the the suspense lean into the the tension i think right in line with that it is what we were just talking about with that that fight with the uh invisible stalker you know, you were saying we had all these ideas of like, I think it might be this, I think it might be that is, you know, that that just adds into the the eeriness and the suspense of it. You're like, should I even kill this thing? You know, if your players don't do that on their own, you could take our example and be like, hmm, what is this thing? Could be this, could be that. like roll a perception check. Like someone's like, wow, what is this? I don't know what this is. I don't know. Roll intelligence, roll perception, whatever. Maybe you think it's her. Like, or just anything, you know, just any little things like that. Just, just throwing seeds of, of, I guess, seeds of doubt. It's because it's going to change how your players. And fear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to change how your players interact with it, and it is going to make it more interesting. So, don't be afraid to mess with that. Don't just straight up lie to them. But you know, yeah, you know, you're not sure. It could be this, maybe that. Exactly. Maybe something else. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Okay, I lied. I do know, but. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> so I definitely want to know from you how you plan on using Xanth or how you used Xanth. Be honest, did your players attack Xanth? Did they were like, oh, shoot him, he's a man on a horse, he's a horse man, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> Let us know in the comment section. Um, if you want to just dunk on me in the comment section about the goof I made, you know, feel free to do that. Also, I'd love to know just any other thoughts you have on this and how your adventure is going. We love to hear stories about this. I get those comments all the time. I think they're just incredible. And I think they spark other ideas in other DMs who are looking to run a lot for a lot of them, their very first adventure. So it's good to show how that works and create community in the comment section down below. It's kind of the joy of making this series of videos specifically is, is hearing what's going on in your games, because there's been so many people who either comment like, I was about to run this quest like I'm so glad you did this whatever then you know this is how I took what you guys did and and changed it or or oh I ran this completely different this is how it happened and it's just we it it honestly is is a joy to to read those it maybe makes us makes us happy and makes us want to do more of them so keep commenting please 
Absolutely. And Josh, speaking of community, should we share a special outro that we've done before? I think we should. <laughs> yeah, I think we should. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Stick around to the end. Donde esta la biblioteca? Me llamo T Bone, la araña discoteca. Discoteca, maniaca, la biblioteca. Es el bigote grande, pero manteca. Manteca, bigote, gigante, pequeño. Cabeza es nieve, cerveza es bueno. Buenos días, me gusta papas fritas. Bigote de recabras, camaran días. Yeah, boy. Boy. Yeah. What? It's 2009. Word. <laughs>